Hey, we're looking at Micah. Micah chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Micah is a hard book to find, so I'll give you a moment to look for it. If you brought your Bibles, uh, if you, of course, an electronic thing, just search Micah. It's a small little book towards the end of the Old Testament. Uh, Micah is uh, it's an interesting book we'll talk about in a moment. I'm going to read verses 1 through 6 as we be, uh, continue our Advent series, The King Who Came. Two weeks ago, we talked about the King of Our Hope. Last week, the king, our righteousness. This morning, the king, our comfort. Micah, chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Hear the word of the Lord. Now, daughter who is under attack, you slash yourself in grief. A siege is set against us. They are striking the judge of Israel on the cheek with a rod. Bethlehem, Ephrathah, you are small among the clans of Judah. One will come from you to be ruler over Israel for me. His origin is from antiquity, from ancient times. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of the ruler's brothers will return to the people of Israel. He will stand and shepherd them in the strength of the Lord, in the majestic name of the Lord his God. They will live securely, for then his greatness will extend to the ends of the earth. He will be their peace when Assyria invades our land, when it marches against our fortresses. We will raise against it seven shepherds, even eight leaders of men. They will shepherd the land of Assyria with a sword, the land of Nimrod, with a drawn blade, so he will rescue us from Assyria when it invades our land, when it marches against our territory. This is the word of the Lord. I'm going to pray in a moment, but let me just sort of set us up here. Some of you remember the TV show, I guess it's still on, called Dirty Jobs, Mike Rowe. Like jobs nobody really wants to do but have to get done. Like jobs that are pretty disgusting. Uh, For instance, bat guano collectors. Worm dung farmers. Road kill cleaners. And one of my favorite, deer urine urine farmers. For hunters who evidently need to spray it on them so they can kill more deer. (laughs) Dirty jobs nobody wants to do. That's sort of the job of the Old Testament prophet. They've got a job that nobody really wants to do. They have to communicate the impact of their sin. They're often delivering messages of accusation and warning and judgment. They do get to communicate a hope of Messiah, a hope of restoration, not seen, but promised. They get to communicate a time of waiting before this deliverer will come. Micah is one of these prophets. It's not a great job he has. The setting isn't great. But his name actually kind of predicts what's going to happen. His name means who is like Yahweh or who is like the Lord. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. But he's confronting a whole nation that's supposed to be God's people, representing God's promise and God's law and God's righteousness on the earth and their kings and their judges are corrupt. God has withdrawn his protection. The poor are being deprived. And this message of Micah swings between judgment and hope. And in this sense, there's a, there's a, God's people are, are being called to find comfort in him. We all need comfort. We can all feel the strain of despair. There's troubles all around us, and for everyone in this room, we have secret troubles within us. That's uh, one of the songs we sing at this time of year, is O Holy Night, and it has this line in it. Long lay the world in sin and Error pining. The word pining means suffering and mental or physical decline. We are, lo- we are, we are just declining into this abyss of, of, of despair. 
And where are we to turn for comfort? Wherever we might turn for momentary comfort, the answer is Jesus is our better comfort. And on that, we will spend a few moments. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, minister among us as we deal with concerns for the globe, but probably more relevant this morning are issues in our souls, in our minds that perplex us and disturb us. Jesus, you have promised to come into this room, into our lives, into our apartments. You've promised to come into where we live and be our comfort. I pray that the word of God this morning would remind us of that and strengthen us in that hope. And that with all the temporal comforts you give us, that you would be seen as our better comforter. Help us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So we're going to look at Micah chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, as we talk about Jesus, our better comforter. And we're going to see that he's come into our darkness, that he came from eternity, that he came to gather a people, and ultimately, he, he came for our peace and security. So let's talk about the first one. The first one is Jesus came into our darkness. It says right there at the beginning in verse 1 of Micah chapter 5, and again, we're sort of picking up the the, uh, prophet's writings here, swinging between judgment and hope. And and here we have a picture of a nation under attack. Uh, It's hard for us to imagine, like, let's just say uh, Concord had a wall around it and uh, all the forces of, of the enemy were gathered around our city gates and around our fortress. And he says, now daughter who's under attack, you slash yourself in grief. A siege is sent, set against us. This nation was about to be overrun by the Assyrians, and the Assyrians were not nice people. They were known to be, they would torture their captives uh, they, they, were, they were known to be absolutely ugly the way that they treated people. And so here you have in despair even the women cutting themselves, which perhaps in the context was maybe not normal, but sort of a way of just expressing their despair. And there's this external darkness that is encroaching on them. Well, Assyria attacking Jerusalem seems about as relevant today as, like, I don't know, the Andy Griffin show. So you don't know what that means. Like, it just doesn't seem relevant. But let me ask you this. What are the external places of darkness that you look and you, you, it, it rattles you? You don't feel peace. You don't feel secure. What are the things when you look out, you go, oh, my goodness, our cities in, are in decline Civility is waning. Global corruption and injustice and war. And maybe you can turn that off. I recommend don't watch the news. It helps. <laughs> you don't have as much anxiety when you're not on, you know, listening to the news. I know you can't live in a, a bubble. But, but then there's the internal struggles. Each one of us in this room, you have these dark feelings and thoughts and and concerns it might be health fear or you don't have enough money to meet what you feel you need you have a really bad job or you live in isolation and loneliness or maybe your children are just like driving you nuts or maybe your adult children are are far from where you want them to be Or maybe you're dealing with grief for the loss of loved ones. Perhaps you're growing older and you have so many unmet dreams. And here we find ourselves relating to the people Micah is talking to. And he says to them, now daughter. He he has this heart like, the way the prophet expresses the heart of God is like a daughter who's in trouble. You're under attack. You slash yourself in grief. 
a siege is against you. Where do you go for comfort? Now, there are some, there are some fine comforts for, you know, temper. A couple weeks ago, I was up in Canada, and they, they serve a comfort food up there called poutine. It's basically French fries with really good gravy and some cheese curds on it. And I ate a whole plate of that sitting next to a window watching it snow in Halifax. And it was so comforting. Nothing wrong with that. But if I kept going to poutine as my ultimate source to deal with the struggles in my heart, first of all, it wouldn't work. And second, I would get very large. We know what it's like to turn to substances for comfort or food or sex or shopping I remember as a young, naive pastor, the first time I was exposed to a young woman who find comfort in cutting herself. We as creatures turn to all sorts of places to deal with the darkness outside and especially the darkness within. But Jesus has come into your darkness and my darkness, and he's a better comforter. He's a better comfort than any of all any of those other weaker comforters. Why? The second point. Because Jesus came from eternity. Now we the, the verse uh, jump to uh, yeah verse two begins with Bethlehem. Now Bethlehem is the center of Christmas, right? But it was predicted way back in in Micah's day that something would come from there. Bethlehem, Ephrata, you are small among the clans of Judah. One who comes from you to be a ruler over Israel for me. His origin is from antiquity, from ancient times. You know, when I need something done at my house, when it comes to plumbing, I call a friend, Ricky, and he, he guides me, he directs me. He only does commercial stuff, but some of you know Ricky Barron, super competent uh, plumber. Uh, if I got an electrical problem, I know the resource to go to is Zeb. He's a private, small contractor, and he's great. Ask Marsha. <laughs> right, Marsha? Uh, like, like, Zeb is a really good electrician. Like, where, when you have a problem, you know you go to the source that can help you resolve the problem. Well, what happens when the problem isn't electrical or plumbing, but it's like this ongoing, insatiable need for comfort and peace that no plumber or electrician or poutine or drink or experience or amount of money is going to help. You see, God has sent someone to us who has no end. He's come from eternity with all the resources of being the eternal one. This is the gospel. This is the doctrine of the incarnation. Now, Jesus came to a place like Bethlehem for lots of reasons, but one of them is to say, listen, regardless of how small and obscure and forgotten you are in your small town, like you may live in Webster, or you may live in some small, like, obscure place, and nobody knows, like New Hampshire, it's ironic. I travel the globe, travel the country. So many people don't even know what New Hampshire is. You know, they get it all mixed up. Like, we're nothing here, Right? except for all the people of Massachusetts. But anyway, that's another story. Um, you may feel obscure, but the Eternal One entered into an obscure, small place with all the resources of eternity. And this is a message, this is the beginning of the message for us. All your struggles, all your despair, all your concerns, all your fears, all of those places of darkness, Jesus has come with all the resources of eternity. This is the theology of a God of eternity sending his son who is eternal to become man, to enter into our world. A couple of weeks ago, uh, my wife was singing in Handel's Messiah. If you have not gone to it, it's free. Every year uh, there's a trust fund that puts it on and it's got professional oboe players and drummers and all this stuff, and the, but the, the choir is all volunteer. In fact, if you're a singer, you ought to volunteer. They need some young people in it. Um, you, ought, you ought to, they practice, um, this is an ad, right? Um, every Sunday, starting in late September, from like two to four, 
And it's fantastic. And the Messiah, which is all scripture. I love to sit through it and just bring the words because it's all scripture. It's all, it's all it is. Handel put all scripture. And it starts with Isaiah chapter 40. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people. There's a tenor singing these words. He says, comfort ye, comfort ye, saith God, speak comfort, comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished and that her iniquity is pardoned. The voice of him crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway of our God. You see, Jesus has come into your darkness with all the resources of his eternal rule and his eternal character, and his eternal heart, and his eternal mercy, and come to you. This is why Jesus is a better comforter. This king came once and is coming again. This promised Messiah who comes into our darkness will eventually come and drive away all darkness. This is the one we keep going to for comfort. Micah's name, as I mentioned, and Micah's name means who is like Yahweh, who's like the Lord. It actually appears, Micah's name actually appears, this is very common in the Bible, in a verse in Micah chapter 7, verse 18. I think we'll get it on the screen here. Who is like you? That's, that's the word Micah. So like it's a play on his name. Who is, who is a God like you, forgiving iniquities and passing over rebellion for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not hold on to his anger forever because he delights in faithful love. Listen, there's nothing wrong with having a little poutine on a a snowy morning, a snowy, a snowy evening. If you're eating poutine in the morning, that's a troubling thought. There's nothing wrong with a little earthly comfort, turning the fireplace up. There's nothing, those are gifts from the Lord. But if that is what you are looking to, to deal with the darkness that pervades externally and internally, you will not be satisfied. And in fact, you will, you will keep craving for and clawing for other comforts. The king has come into your darkness from eternity past. He's a better comforter, and he's come to gather a people. This is the third thought from verse 4. He will stand and shepherd them in the strength of the Lord, in the majestic name of the Lord his God. They will live securely, for then his greatness will extend to the ends of the earth. If you were to read, took time to read back in Micah, in Micah chapter 2, the Lord promises to gather all of his people, to collect a remnant. These were rebels that he plans to regather, to re reawaken them to his grace and his forgiveness and regather them. If you're a Christian here today, you are part of this regathering story. Your story of God regathering you, he came to you in your darkness. He showed you his eternal power from the past, and he's come to you to gather you to his people. My story be, with, with the, the regathering of Jesus me, in, into his flock, into his family, into his church, happened about 10 miles east of here in an old parsonage that has now been torn down. I was a little boy, and the weight of sin became evident to me. I was in a community of faith, and I knew the gospel, and I knew I needed to get Jesus on the inside. I climbed the stairs of that parsonage and found my dad sitting in his rocking chair, still that rocking chair. I've been trying to imagine, was I on his left knee or his right knee when I sat on his lap and asked Jesus to take away my sin? And I was born not just into him, born again, but born into his family. I was regathered. And then the family, the church, became now my extended family forever. Have you been regathered? Have you heard the voice of the one who says, I will stand with you in the strength of the Lord. You will live securely. Two weeks ago, I was at Logan Airport, two weeks ago this morning, watching this service online. And for those of you watching online, listen, there are also all sorts of good reasons to watch online. If you're home sick with COVID, stay home. You know, uh, you're traveling, I got to watch. Some of you need to get your tail's in here because you're being lazy, but you know who I'm talking to. Um, but, but, but as I watched that and listened to the testimonies of 13 members being brought into 
our particular flock as a shepherd, as one of the pastors. That's the word pastor means shepherd. We're the under shepherds of Jesus. I was just thrilled about not just this eternal gathering that God's called us to, but this, this special, unique flock called River of Grace. We're just one of probably a million, well, millions of gatherings like this, flocks like this. But this particular flock, as a pastor, it just created a, a joy in my, my heart. And it reminded me of 1 Peter 5, because as pastors, as shepherds, our job is to reflect the eternal shepherd. 1 Peter 5 says this, Shepherd the flock, God's flock among you, not overseeing out of compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not out of greed for money, but eagerly, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being example to the flock. And when the chief shepherd, Jesus, comes back again, when he appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. You see, Jesus came into your darkness with all the resources and all of his, his uh, divine, eternal nature. He came to gather us into an eternal flock that has a local expression that we might demonstrate the kingdom that is coming. That's the whole Luke thing we've been reading, studying, and as we'll return to, this is why we gather by the way, let me just say, there's a, bad, a bunch of bad shepherds out there. Many of them are on the internet. If you get enthralled with an internet shepherd or pastor or teacher, someone who claims to speak for God, I have two recommendations for you. First, check with your local shepherds because we have to give an account. Let us weigh in on whether we think that's a good teacher or not. Because the internet Bible teachers, they don't have to give an account for your soul, but we do. A number, second recommendation, don't allow your online fascination to dri- draw you away from the gathering of God's people that need you to contribute your gifts and your presence and your, your love and your faithful prayers. Why, would I, why did I go there? Well, because Jesus is in this business of entering into our darkness with his eternal resources and and, and character and nature to draw us into a flock which will be eternal. It says there at the end, for then his greatness will extend to the ends of the earth. This is the message of hope. Micah predicts that people will stream to a new Jerusalem in chapter 4, verse 1 where an eternal King Jesus, the Good Shepherd, will reside. Hey, if you haven't watched Bible projects, look it up sometime. Like, you can, you get, like, it's really a fascinating, like, they're really well done cartoon, not cartoon, sort of things. Scripts on, on a particular text you want to look up. I looked up Micah, and, and I, was, I was really moved by the way they talked about that Eventually, Jesus will dwell in the new heaven and new earth. You know, the the five foot six Jesus, who's both God and man, the one who's forever reduced himself to our size, even though he's the eternal king of the universe. He's forever adopted a human body to save you and me. He will reside on a new heaven and new earth and a new Jerusalem. And it is where heaven and earth will meet and nations will flock there. In other words, people from, every, this is why we believe in planting churches around the globe and among the Rendeli people in, in, in Kenya and the uh, Manika people in Mozambique. This is why we, we believe that the gospel is carried out by God's people. Why? It's because God calls us to, to keep re- sending this message of regathering people into God's flock. And someday that final regathering will happen. And for now, we live with the peace and the security of knowing our king is among us. Someday, all the darkness will be drawn away. But our king, and this is the last point, our king came for our peace and security, both now and in eternity. This is why he's a better comfort. He, it says in verse 5, he will be their peace. Now, I could stop right there because the rest of it starts talking about Assyria. Like, what, how does that relate to us here in Concord? We have to understand when Mike was writing this, there, were, there, were bad, there was a bad nation attacking them who are super cruel outside their, their, uh, their capital walls. 
And how can, how can you and I, in the midst of global calamity, how can you and I, in the midst of personal tragedy, experience peace and comfort and security? It's because the king has come into our darkness with all the resources of eternity. He has come to gather us into a people and to give you and me right now, right now, peace and security. In 2015, I, my wife and I and two of our boys were in Israel. Um, just a huge honor. And part of our tour took us up to the Golan Heights, which is kind of like the north uh, east part of Israel. And we're looking over towards, I think it's Syria. I forget which country is over there. But we hear, we're, we're at this like rest area, and we hear out in the distance, boom, boom. There's fighting going on over there, boom. And I actually think it was between um, factions in Syria, not actually Israel and Syria. I think that was the nation. But as we're there, and I remember it vividly at this rest area, there was a, there was a little uh, concession stand selling fresh cherries. And uh, the, 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 the fruit produce in, in Israel is amazing. And so we're, we're eating fresh cherries. And then up pulls a UN peacekeeping vehicle. And out pile all these brothers, I say brothers, I, I, I don't know if they're Christians, but they're from some exotic island, like Tahiti or something, and they were part of the peacekeeping force and a UN peacekeeping force in Israel. And we got talking with them a little bit, and they couldn't wait to get home. I, you know, I can imagine, like, dry, arid, uh, why God chose Israel, it is not the prettiest place on earth. I've been to a lot of prettier places on earth, and Israel's not one of them. God chose it just because he loves to prove that he comes to any of our dusty streets and brings beauty. But these peacekeepers could not wait to get home. And after we talked a bit, I, it, it, I, I, I thought about this, like, regardless of all the good efforts of the UN or all the, you know, the global work in NATO to try to bring peace, it, finally, it's not going to work. It's not going to bring ultimate peace. Let it hold back the darkness for a while. There's only one who will bring ultimate peace. And while we are to pray for our leaders, we got an election coming up. Don't get wigged out. Jesus is going to appoint somebody, somebody we deserve. <laughs> Think about that. Um, the Bible says in, in Timothy, pray for those in our leadership, in our government leadership. Why? that we might live at peace. There is a Prince of Peace coming. And until Jesus comes, there'll be all sorts of temporary attempts at peace, and these are not bad attempts at peace. But this is Paul writing to, in Thessalonians, he writes these verses. I think it'll be up on the screen, yeah. When they say peace and security, because that's what we all want. We want peace in our homes, peace in our country. We want security. We want to know the economy is going to be okay and the interest rates won't go any higher and that you know, our kids will have good education and, and not get sick. And like We want peace and security. When they say this, then sudden destruction will come upon them like labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. That's a reminder that with all the efforts that the world makes towards peace and security, because we were made in the image of God for peace and security, with all the Christless attempts that are made, they will fail. Doesn't mean they're bad, but they will fail. But our good shepherd is our strong shepherd. It actually says that in, in, in uh, let's say, I think it's verse, verse 6, they will shepherd the land of Assyria with a sword. <laughs> now imagine, imagine. Mike is writing to people, and Assyria is attacking them, and they've go, they got these wicked, awful Assyrians are coming. And, and the prediction is, and God will raise up shepherds who will shepherd Assyria with a sword. Now, shepherds aren't all, like, gentle and lowly. Sometimes they're fierce and protective. We are still in the time of the evil before the final judgment. And here we are, in Advent, thinking about hope. Our first Sunday of Advent was the King is our hope. We're also longing for a day when everything's right, including our own souls. 
Well, a king has come and will come, our king of righteousness. And while we wait in the midst of of the darkness of this world and the darkness that we, we fight against in our souls of anxiety, financial stress, and loneliness and despair, this king has come to give us comfort. This is the comfort that Jesus has promised us. And so as we move ahead with the last week before Christmas, as we, as we sort, of, sort of do a mock-up to what it's like to wait for Christ to ultimately come, when he ultimately comes back, here's a couple of suggestions. What darkness do you need Jesus to come into? What are those places internally that you, you've got anxiety, you've got sadness, or despair, or grief, confusion? Would you name that to Jesus? Would you let him be honest with him about that darkness? Also, you might want to confess to Jesus, not might want to, you should. What is your go-to comfort that you're using to replace Jesus? What are you turning to? Maybe it's just keeping yourself so stinking busy, you don't have time to think. It's when your comfort is trying to just fill your life with oblivion. Name it. What are you leaning on that isn't Jesus for your comfort? Because it will not satisfy. It may take care of you for 18 months, but it's not going to satisfy. And then just call out to Jesus. Say, Jesus, in this dark place in my life, in this dark season, in this dark world, in, in my anxiety, in my fear, in my doubts, in my anger, in my brokenness, in this darkness, would you be Would you, Jesus, be my peace and comfort? There's a song we sing at Christmas at times. It's, Come thou long expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. From our fears and sin release us. Let us find our rest in thee. Israel's strength and consolation, hope of all the earth thou art, dear desire of every nation. Joy of every longing heart. Friends, Jesus is a better comfort and comforter. Invite him into your darkness. Invite him to be your comfort. Ask him to give you peace and security. We quoted a verse from Micah that, um, in fact, maybe we can put it back up on the screen uh, it's that 718. Yeah, there we go. Who is a God like you? Forgiving iniquities and passing over rebellion. For the remnant of his inheritance, he does not hold on to his anger forever because he delights in faithful love. We end our time reflecting on Jesus and his word by actually acting out a reminder that what gives us peace and security with God and with our own conscience is what he has done, not what we have done. The night Jesus was betrayed, uh, he took bread, and as Paul says, for I received from the Lord that which I also pass on to you on the night that Jesus was betrayed. The Lord Jesus took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same night he took a cup, which uh, is filled with wine. And he said, this cup is a new promise, a new covenant, a new deal. It's in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Sisters and brothers, we go through this on a regular basis because we're proclaiming that the king who has promised to bring us peace and security has died for everything that can be opposed to you, including your own death. He has taken our guilt and our shame. And so we proclaim, we declare that we are satisfied with Jesus enough for our peace and security. I'm going to pray and then invite you to come forward if you're a follower of Jesus. If you're not a follower of Jesus, this isn't for you yet. But I'm going to invite you to come forward and take a piece of bread Remembering that that represents the Christ who died for you. Dip it in 
the grape juice, which reminds us that his, his blood was shed so yours wouldn't have to be in the judgment of God. And take it in as you receive again a reminder that Christ is your comfort and your security.